Hi, this is Robin Cavallar with the Cavallar Heath Group of Remax One, and Darren Rickwood of First Home Mortgage and I are going to talk today about insurance and escrows and all that fun stuff the mortgage company collects for you. So, how are you today? I'm wonderful. How are you, Robin? Good. It's like, I can't believe it's a, another week of house arrest. So. Oh, <laughs> I went out yesterday to the grocery store and you get so excited over the littlest things. I know, I, was, <laughs> I go out, but then at the same time, it's like wearing that mask. I feel like I'm suffocating. Yes. And I can't get out fast enough. Yep. So. Yep. Yeah. So what kind of questions you got today? We want to talk about escrows. I love it. All right. So I, the question I get a lot is why do mortgage companies collect money for insurance and taxes? So it's, it's really, one is protection. Um, it is a separate account. So when we collect taxes or insurance, it's held in an escrow account. It's a separate account from your actual mortgage and your payments. So when you make your payment, let's say $1,000 is towards principal and interest, $300 is for taxes and insurance. That money is split up. The $300 goes into the escrow account. The 1000 goes towards your principal and interest to pay down your loan. When the bills come due, from either your insurance company, which is typically annually, or from the county for taxes, which is typically semi-annually, the bank actually pays it for you, you the consumer. They pay it out of that escrow account. So we as a lender, depending on when you settle, the date, of time to year, everything else, we make sure we have enough in that account to start so that when a bill comes out, we can pay it. If we were to not pay it, and let's say someone defaults on their mortgage and tax bill comes due, well, the bank's not holding it. They can't pay it. They're not going to take money out of their reserves and pay the tax bill. That tax lien becomes um, a primary lien above the mortgage. So it takes priority over the mortgage being held by the bank. So when you go to foreclosure or everything else and they're negotiating or short sale, that tax lien has to be paid first and foremost before the bank gets any money for their loan. So that's the okay. biggest piece. Um, most people actually enjoy it. I mean, I, you find a few here or there that don't want their monies escrowed. They'd rather hold it themselves. Um, you're not making that much on it, but they just, they feel like they're better off managing it themselves and sending in the payments. The other reason is insurance. If you don't pay your insurance, something happens and the property becomes uninsured. The bank actually has the right to do what's called forced insurance, where they'll force insurance upon the property. You have to take it at their rate, everything else, which may be much, much higher than anything you're going to find on your own. So you're insuring the property for the bank and for yourself, not, not just to protect yourself. So God forbid the house burns down. And let's say the house costs four hundred thousand, and they owe three hundred thousand on it. Does the insurance company give the check to you, and then you give the balance back to the homeowner um, once you're paid off, or how does that work? Or it, does it that go towards building it? Yeah, it depends on the cost. If you are rebuilding a house, that's a larger cost, typically over $3,000 or $5,000, that check is made payable to you um, and insurance company, everything else. So it's a two-party check that comes to you. So there's a management process in something that large. When you're rebuilding a house, contractors, everything else, the insurance company's inspecting the property as you go, as well as, you know, say your county inspectors, everything else. They want to make sure what they're paying for, it's just like when we do a construction loan mm -hmm. or a rehab loan, we want to make sure if we're going to cut a check to somebody, and they say, hey, I've done this work. They want to make sure the work's been done. So they're not going to send that money out until they send out an inspector and make sure it's completed. Okay. Um, and then it, I know it's like if the house, if they don't make their tax payment and the, the um, county or the state becomes uh, the primary lien holder and they're foreclosing, they don't care how much they owe you. They're going to sell it for what they're owed. Correct. And well, you're right. Then you get into tax sales, everything else. Um, <laughs> typically, that's when there's not a mortgage, I would think. But it, yeah. you know, let's say you foreclose and you've got a two hundred thousand dollar mortgage and you owe, well, let's say six thousand dollars in back taxes. The bank settles for two hundred thousand, 
that $6,000 comes off the top before the bank gets their piece. The county is due their money and is paid whole prior to the bank getting any money. Wow. And so at settlement, how do y'all figure out how many tax, how many months of taxes you collect up front? So think of there's a simple calculation, which title companies do a lot of. Mm -hmm. um, we estimate it on our end when we do prelim uh, work or fee sheets. But if you settle, it always varies based on the day you settle and the month. Tax bills come out in July and December. So we'll go off, we'll work off of those dates when the tax bills are, are supposed to come out. If you settle, let's say, um, let's just say June, let's say June 15th, your first payment is until August 1st. So in a case like that, the title company would actually hold extra money from the get-go because they mm -hmm. can't record that mortgage at the county until the tax bill is paid due. So just in case it comes out, ah. they have to pay it. So this time of the year, we're getting into this time of the year where it's a little bit different. At the closer you get to those tax bills being due, you know, the numbers kind of change and money set aside. New construction's the same way. But on a typical deal, let's say we close uh, March 15th. Okay. Your first payment uh, will not be till May 1st. Okay. So between May and July, that's three months, three payments you will make. Okay. We want to make sure there's at least six months to pay the tax bill and then also a couple months buffer. So we're going to hold enough in the account. So you're looking at probably collecting about five to six months of taxes. And then for our, on our side, we need to keep that in mind for how much we're asking for closing help if the buyer needs it from the seller. Right. Because they could end up having to bring money to the table um, if, we, if we don't budget it right. Yeah, and a, and a title company would be a good one to talk to too because there's aggregate adjustments and they adjust that escrow account because the banks by law are not allowed to hold so much in escrow. And you'll mm -hmm. see that if you go to closing on your settlement sheet, title company's going down the line and they get to the end of the escrow and it says, and an aggregate adjustment of $375. That's yeah. because they're subtracting money out of it because by law, they're only allowed to hold so much. I love the ones where I see it's like an, an adjustment of like $5. <laughs> <So> right. right. <laughs> Those are the ones that crack me up every time. So. We, you know, as a rule, generally, unless I'm really getting tight on numbers or I know it's going to be more like with new construction or an investment property, I generally, as a, as a rule of thumb, I'm going to use eight months taxes, you know, and then we'll have so many months of insurance put into escrow. And can the, can the buyer pay for the homeowner's insurance at the settlement table, or does that have to be paid for ahead of time? No, we, we generally, they, it's their choice. Um, you can yeah. pay it ahead of time. The difference is we get a paid receipt versus an invoice. So if they pay it ahead of time, um, or they come to the, either one, they got to pay it. Yeah. Sometimes the sellers are paying it, you know, with closing mm -hmm. help that one year up front, we build it into all our closing costs. So if someone has a hundred dollar insurance premium, which is what I typically estimate, that's $1,200 due for the first year up front, which is a requirement. We'll add that into closing costs. So if the seller's paying it, great. If not, the buyer's coming to the table with it. So yeah. it's, it's really their choice. You have to pay it no matter what, whether the title company sends a check to your insurance company or you pay it ahead of time, they're going to get their money. Yeah, that's always a fun one. And it's like, I just have one buyer and um, the lady I'm going to talk to on Monday, Erin Lewis with Goosehead, she, oh my word, it was a horrible nightmare. The buyer's insurance was more than double what was predicted and yeah. he ended up doing like a ten thousand dollar deductible or something insane to get the cost down and then she was able to rewrite it after we closed and get it down to a normal price but all of a sudden he's scrambling trying to figure out how to come up with an extra nineteen hundred dollars two days before settlement because of it and that's you know and it's really weird because you'll get insurance in some of these areas that's double what you expect i mean i've gotten to the point i used to estimate 75 dollars and 90 and now at the lowest i go is usually about a hundred dollars unless i know the area or it's a townhouse or condo mm -hmm. um i estimate a hundred dollars and up for insurance yeah 
there's there's little pockets. Um, uh, Calvert County, right here near Brooms mm -hmm. Island, St. Leonard, that sort of thing. It's it's whether it's high risk for wind or what have you, but a lot of areas here you'll see insurance that's much higher than you would expect just due to the area. So, and speaking of that, um, sorry. Did I lose you? Nope, I'm here. Okay, yeah, my phone was ringing and all of a sudden the screen went <laughs> blank. <laughs> blank. <laughs> so let me turn on my phone on do not disturb because um, that was weird. So um, flood insurance. Yeah. Do y'all like put the address in and it automatically comes up and says required or suggested or? Uh, yeah, so you'll do a flood cert. That's part of every package just to make sure, you know, the banks do it, everything else. But you can go to FEMA's website Mm -hmm. FEMA has a great interactive map. You can plug in the address and it'll tell you exactly low risk or zone um, AE1 or whatever it may be. And you'll know right off the bat whether it needs flood insurance or not. When it comes to how much, that's a whole mm -hmm. nother ballgame. <laughs> so it's a separate policy that just yeah. protects you for flood. There's a lot of factors that go into it. You know, where you are, what zone. Then there's an elevation cert that's typically required. It's not, it's not essential, but if you don't have a flood cert, you generally end up with the highest amount of flood insurance there is. You, you go right to the top of the list. If you get an elevation cert and it ends up being the house is up on four blocks or up on stilts and you know it's not that bad, your flood insurance may be reduced and cut in half. Hmm. So it's dramatic. Um, there's, so there's, there's certain things you can do to the property, meaning your HVAC being up on a platform, you know, all kinds of things. And, but then that also goes into their affordability too. It does. It does. So you're looking at some properties, which may have a hundred dollars a month in homeowners insurance, but then may have $250 a month in flood insurance on top of that. Good Lord. Depending on where it is. And so if they were just outside the flood area, then they could afford a much more expensive house. Right. Because they're so, not paying too so much you guys as agents Going into a situation like that, if you know, hey, this house is maybe going to need it, you give us a call, we put it in and we go, yeah, mm -hmm. it needs flood insurance. Then you talk to the sellers and say, hey, do you guys have flood insurance? And if they have a loan, most likely yeah. they do. If they have it, generally their policy, if it's old enough, is going to be a lot cheaper than what there is now and the new owners can actually take over that policy oh. so the insurance companies kind of handle that between themselves but they can assume that seller's flood insurance policy and take over even if it's a premium that was put in place five years ago that's pretty cool yeah um so kind of switch it up a little bit appraisals because right now we are we're in a seller's market still. Um, I ran the numbers for Calvert today and it was 19 houses that were listed in the last three days and 19 went under contract. And then I think it was like um, 40 that were listed in the last week and like 52 went under contract. So we're definitely seeing the inventory reduce, houses are not staying on the market long. Mm -hmm. And part of that with the multiple bids is people buyers are offering more for the properties in some cases so how is that going to impact appraisals if you know we don't have the comps to justify the price the buyer is putting out there it's it's tough um and we're, we're seeing it in few i've got a few appraisal issues things like that that you know houses came in under value and you go back and forth trying to justify but it's when there's not a lot of comps, I mean, that houses have to be similar in build. In other words, basement to basement, crawl space to crawl space. They can't commingle. Um, square footage, they want to see square footage being the same without not a lot of adjustments unless you have to. You know, and, and relative area. You know, I've, I've got one now that a, a comp is used and it's three miles out and they don't like that. Well, so... Yeah, because three miles is going to be a huge difference in value. Right, right. They want everything a mile or less if they can get it. Now, sometimes there's not. 
you know, if there's, if there's no sales like now, I mean, we, we don't have a huge uh, amount of inventory and it's not like, you know, there's, there's every house on the street is under contract or being listed. It's not a new community. You may be your only option, especially in some of the rural Calvert or rural St. Mary's areas. Yeah. So that's, that becomes a, a question for the appraiser that he's going to have to justify why they went out and used this comp, why they use that. And we're seeing a lot of that. Yeah. And then the thing I ran into a lot is, this, you know, some appraisers want you to bring them all your, the comps you use. Some get offended if you do. And there's no rhyme or reason. And it's so cr challenging on our side too. Mm -hmm. um, and half the time you want to look at them and go, they're willing to pay this amount. They're willing to accept it. And that's the definition of market value. And yeah. Uh, the, the problem is you've got a bank, a third party that goes, well, I'm not going to lend you money on that house when it's not worth that. Yeah. You could default next month and I'm stuck upside down. Mm -hmm. Especially, you know, majority of our buyers, USDA, VA, they're financing 100%. Yeah. I mean, I joke. It's like, yeah, if I could sell my house for a million bucks, I'd put it on the market right now. Um, <laughs> your house is worth what somebody's willing to pay for it, right? How many times have you heard that? It's like, you know, yeah, I think this thing is priceless. Um, and someone else will go, yeah, no. <laughs> right. There is a definite price for everything. Um, so, and then one, speaking of appraisals, one of the questions I get a lot from my VA clients is, they assume the appraiser is going out to do a VA inspection. And I keep trying to explain to them that they're only appraising it and you've got pretty much a checklist of items they look at, you know, but it's not an inspection and they're not going to check the quality of the work or anything else like that. So. Right. It's, it's not a home inspection. I mean, they are VA approved appraisers you know, ordered through VA portal, everything separate and independent of any list we have. Um, and it, you know, they do have certain things they have to look for and make sure of, but you're right. They're not doing an inspection of the house or anything like that. We get that too. I mean, a lot of buyers, you know, especially first time home buyers, well, when's the inspection scheduled? They don't understand the difference between an inspection and an appraisal a lot of times. Yeah. And that's, that's something I've been seeing a lot lately. I'm like, no, 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 no the appraiser is going to glance at the roof. They're going to walk through the house, but sometimes they're there for 15 minutes. Sometimes they're there for an hour and sometimes they just barely show up. Um, the biggest thing is health and safety issues and anything they question or don't know about. They're not the expert. They're going to mark it on there and says, you know, uh, get a certified inspector or certified contractor to look at this and then repair anything he requires. Yeah. And the biggest one I see right now is a uh, stair railing. If it's more than three steps. Mm -hmm. And we just, had one the other day that was deck boards, you know, boards were popped up. It was a tripping hazard. Oh, huh. Shoot, for me, air is tripping hazards. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, could be, it could be anything. It could be missing pickets. It could be stairs. It could be railing. Handrails are a big one. We see handrails a lot. Yeah. I, I don't think I've seen a roof from a VA appraisal in a long time, but I know they look at them too. And yeah. normally in that case, the home inspectors already flagged it and we've negotiated before the right. appraiser even gets out there. Right. So, because if the inspector comes in and the roof is leaking, obviously, yeah, need a new one. Um, and then, so just kind of staying on the same guidelines with all the stuff y'all get. Um, why is it some loans you need the septic well and termite, and then others they don't? You know, so it's a it's a specific guideline per FHA, VA, USDA, and conventional. They they all are different, um, and that's that's just a basis from Fannie, Freddie, HUD, and VA of what they require and don't require. Um, me personally, I don't know. I don't know why each one <laughs> requires something a little bit different. 
Uh, you know, conventional is typically an as is. They don't require any reports or inspections unless mm -hmm. the appraiser notes an issue. You know, yeah. in all of them, if an appraiser notes anything, if it's not a requirement, but the appraiser notes it, termite damage. That's always a big one. If termite, mm -hmm. for an example, if termite damage shows up, an appraiser makes note of it, or even evidence he sees tubes outside or on a shed, it's going to call for a termite inspection, repair, and, and then if he sees them, then, you know, the inspector has to comment whether or not there's any damage, and if there's damage, it has to be repaired. Yeah, we just automatically share all three of them with you. So yep. that, because to us, it's too confusing. Yeah, right. it's like yeah. this type of music. Yeah, it, yeah, I've got the checklist for all the contract items, like send the inspections to the, you know, send those three items to the lender, done. I, you know, whatever you do with them, I don't care. Yep. If it's too much information, meh. Um, and then, so when you need a septic inspection, are y'all fine with the dye test or? Yes. Yeah. Basic, basic tests are fine for those. Um, you know, again, it really depends on what they say. I mean, if it, if it's required and it comes back and it's not a complete hundred percent pass, you know, they'll require more, you know, and, and basic bacteria for water and everything else. Yeah, those are always the fun one when people are like, oh my God, what's in my water? I'm like, oh, you don't want to know. Just, <laughs> <laughs> just get a shot and it will that's come back. Been, that's <laughs> the biggest thing this year has been a lot of failed septic systems. Um, just ages yeah. of the houses, I mm -hmm. guess maybe lucky, <laughs> unlucky, mm -hmm. however you want to put it. I've had a lot of those on houses this year. Almost half of our buyers had a failed septic inspection last year. Mm -hmm. And the nice part is when the seller could take advantage of the grant program and the grant program would pay for the tank to be replaced with the nitrogen reducing one. And right. then the, um, the seller would just have to pay for the drain fields and the, you know, the permits. But that's a huge expense that's off their plates, you know, yeah. with, you know but it runs out of money last year ran out of money fast. Um, and some of the deals had to be postponed till the fall when the program was refunded. Right. And because yep. otherwise the seller just didn't have the money and there was nothing else we could do about it. Yeah. And that'd be a great conversation with somebody as well as to talk about how to take care of your septic. Yeah. Cause there's, it's, it's the wear and tear a lot of times from, you know, the, the owners. Mm -hmm. and, and which has taught me a lot here. I mean, how you take care of it, you know, getting it pumped, everything else. I mean, maintenance. Hey, um, so next Monday, I'm talking with, like I said, Aaron Lewis about insurance. The following Monday is going to be Ryan Nagy with Spec Home Inspections. Awesome. Because um, he How does, most, yeah, he does most of the inspections for my buyers. Um, and he's entertaining anyway. So <laughs> it's like, never a dull moment with him and Sean. So. Yeah. Well, that, that'll that be an interesting one because that's a lot of stuff that whether you're buying or selling, I mean, it's good things to know. And even on a regular basis, still having your house inspected. It's like right. going to a doctor for a checkup. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, but anyway, well, I appreciate you answering those questions because that's what I keep getting a lot of from my clients lately is why do you have to pay that? And why does a mortgage company keep it? And right. now I can say, go back and watch our video. I'll explain it. So. We'll send them on. Yeah, and I'm, I'm always available. So if anybody has any questions, just have them call me. I know. I appreciate go. that. That's one of the things I like about you. So I can always reach you. Yeah, especially now. I'm always home. <laughs> and it's like, oh, but I need to get away from my house. <laughs> and I want to be able to be out without a mask on and hanging out with friends. And no. um I, and I have broken down and started using the colored hairspray. When it's, the, <laughs> weather turns and it goes to 80, 85 degrees, it's going to be much worse. Oh, God. It's like your makeup will be melting underneath uh, the mask. Yeah. You're going to be um, out. 
And if you're on some of the public beaches, you may have to wear the mask with the bathing suit, so you can have the funny tan lines. You have to have matching masks. I mean, you know. Oh, it's like a this bathing suit I shared on Facebook the other day is like a bikini with the matching mask. <laughs> it's perfect. It's like this year's summer trend. <laughs> so, COVID nineteen. Yeah, 19. that's that's it. So, all right. Well, it was wonderful chatting again, and we'll do it next week. All right. Thanks. Talk to you soon. Okay.